Romans chapter 15. We then that are strong, chapter 14, talking about the one that's lacking faith, helping that guy who's not built in the Lord yet. He's got some beliefs. He's got some things he's doing that's not right. We don't slam him. We just take him by the hand and show him, hey, that's what the Bible. But we that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak. We're supposed to help the young the young babes in Christ, those that are growing in Christ. We're supposed to guide them. We're supposed to help them. They're not supposed to be notches. Oh, look how many people I got saved. It's not how many people you got saved. It's how many people did you grow? There are women today that will give birth to five, six babies, and they don't take care of them. They rush them off to the government. They rush them off to daycare. They rush them off to school. That's not a mother. A mother will take that child from birth, nourish that child in her bosom, and raise that child, and help that child, and grow that child, and then that's what we're supposed to do for young Christians. That's what we're supposed to do when a Christian gets gets saved. That's what it looks like what Paul did to Timothy. Raised him. To bear the infirmities of the weak and not to please ourselves. Whoa. It's not about us. We notch ourselves with look at how many converts we got and then we just leave them dead dying deformed retarded for the wolves to come along you realize if you were to go to the Jehovah Witness and talk to those kind of people the Mormon you realize there's a lot of Christians in that those assemblies they just didn't know any better they didn't have enough strength in the word no one took care of them so along comes these wolves and devours them Let every one of us please his neighbor for his good to education. Not please ourselves. Not entertainment for ourselves. It's never about ourselves. For even Christ pleased not himself. But it is written, he... The reproaches of them that reproach thee fell on me, Christ speaking. It was not joy to God to be beaten with alone. You think it was joyful for Jesus? Everybody went to their house and he went to the mountain to go fall asleep or spend the night in prayer. You think it was pleasure that, that Jesus prayed in that garden that that sin, that cup, would not fall on him? And yet still, for others, he went and suffered and died. For whatsoever thing we, uh, for whatsoever things were written aforetime, the Old Testament. Were written for our learning. Oh, I don't want to read that Old Testament. It's, no, it was there for us to learn. So, if man don't study history, he's bound to repeat the history and not learning nothing from it. That Old Testament, the Gospels, are filled with, with events and stories to help us say no, help us say yes, to more understand God. America does not realize by reading Genesis, well, you're not, I forget what, about halfway through Genesis, that there are cities that God destroyed because of sexual sin, because of pride, because of arrogance, because of boundness of food and strength of, look at what we did. That's in the Bible. Why don't people believe that today? Because they haven't read their Bible. They haven't opened the Bible. Their, their churches are not even open to the Bible. That Old Testament is to teach us a lesson. It records man's failures. It records man's success. It records God's attitude. That we, through patience and comfort of the Scriptures, might have hope. 
So somebody who's always down, always doubting their salvation, always, I'm not going to get through. They're not in the Bible. Yes, the things come along in life, you know, they're, they're hardship, they bring troubles, they bring sorrow. But if you are an active Bible reader, study doer, you know it'll come. Listen, you know that one day Jesus Christ is coming and he'll end all the troubles and problems. Everything that we're worried about now, either the grave or, or the rapture, will take care of. And then there'll be no more our problems. Now, the God of patience, that's the problem. It's not patience. It's the God of patience. God is in no hurry as much as we are. And consolation grant you to be like-minded one toward another according to Christ Jesus. Oh, so God wants unity amongst the believers and of, of the church. Well, how can we have unity if one guy is celebrating a pagan holiday, one guy is, is, you know, you can't eat this, you can't eat that. One person is, is like, you know, I got this Bible and you got this Bible. Oh, I like this preacher. I don't like that preacher. I go fishing on this day and, you know, it's all messed up. We've got to come to the common ground that is Jesus Christ. And this chapter 15 is written to the ones that are strong, not to the weak ones. We're supposed to be gathering those weak in the faith to be strong in unity, and yet we are failures ourselves. And God sits there with patience trying to get us to do right. That ye may with one mind and one mouth glorify God. And even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now look at that. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Toward another according to Christ Jesus, that ye may with one mind and one mouth glorify God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Did you just see what Paul did with Jesus there? He said, God. And then... The Father of the Lord Jesus. That's, God is God, the Father of Jesus. But Paul wrote God as Jesus. So why can't you get religions together? Because they don't acknowledge Jesus Christ as God. There's no common ground there. They've got someone else. The common ground is for the, for the strong in faith. And the weak in faith, the common ground, God is Jesus. And Jesus is God. And if you can snatch a weak in faith off to another religion and teach them something else. About God being Jesus and Jesus being God. Well then you've got someone who's not going to grow. They're a spiritual retard. And a retard does not grow. Cannot defend himself. Can't do things for himself. Wherefore receive ye one another. As Christ also received us to the glory of God. We're supposed to be helping each other with the talents that God has given us. We are supposed to be aiding each other. We're not supposed to be relying on the government and lost people. We ought to be, if we need money, instead of going to a, a lost bank, we should be able to go with a reputation and character to a saved man and say, you know, I need money for this. But see, the problem is a lot of times that we don't, that we claim that we need money, it's for stupid uses, and we know that we won't be given the money by a fellow Christian because they're going to say, that's a stupid idea. We ought not be running down to welfare. We ought to be running to the people in the church helping them out and them helping us out voluntarily rather than asking for aid. We ought to be praying for them even if we don't know if they have a need. 
I've got names throughout all of my Bible here as I read through the year, people's names that I have to pray for and remind me to pray for them. We are not supposed to be running to the world. Now I'm looking for a job right now and I got I got a physical thing where I can't work and my car now and the light just came on and stuff like that. And you know like you're thinking if we were truly good Christians, we would start our own businesses and we would hire ourselves in the church that we would be employed, we would be making business, and we would be doing proper etiquette. And as born again Bible believing Christians, wouldn't you think if we started businesses in our church, we'd be the best well known business to hire? And you wouldn't be able to hire those other people because they're crooks? No. Christians today have been, become crooks and deceivers. A lot of times I find out the guy says he's a Christian. I, I, okay, I'm not doing business with you. That's what it's come to. But we're supposed to be this family. And we're supposed to help each other. We're supposed to guide each other. But instead we got cliques. We've got pride. And it's a broken church. It's a sick church. Wherefore, receive ye one another as Christ also received us the glory of God. Christ received me as I was, a vast, wicked sinner. And you know what? A person in the church, you don't know half the stuff that person has done in a lifetime as Christ knows you. You know some of the things I've done in my life, but my church wouldn't allow me in. They know enough, but they don't know all that Christ knows. And still he said, come to me. And I'll wash you. And I'll make you clean. And I'll make you a child of God the Father. I'll give you a comforter. God took me in. We ought to take others in too. Now I say that Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision, Jews, for the truth of God. To confirm the promises made unto the fathers, the land grant, all the covenants to the Jews. Verse 8 is to Jews, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Jesus came to fulfill all that was written about him. And he's going to fulfill all into Revelation 21 and 22. All prophecies will be fulfilled by Revelation 21 and 22. There'll be a time where there'll be no more prophesying. It'll be all fulfilled. 100%. And the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy. That's me. I glorify God and praise God because guess what? His mercy saved my soul. It is written, For this cause I will confess to thee among the Gentiles and sing unto thy name. Did you know? Do you understand, Gentile? That when you believed on Jesus Christ as your Savior, you were prophecy after the death, burial, resurrection, and first advent of Jesus Christ. Just because Jesus died and rose again, those 48 prophets, they're not done. There are more. And when, when Gentiles in the book of Acts started coming to Jesus and getting saved, Cornelius, that Ethiopian unit, that is prophecy still being fulfilled today. Any Gentile that gets saved from what we just read right now. I've got a God who said something hundreds and thousands of years ago that's still happening 100%. Let's see, let's see your religion do that. You'll find out in falseness. And again, he says, Rejoice ye Gentiles with his people, Jews. Now, what Jew would, re would reference that mark? That part of the scripture. The Jews and Gentiles were enemies. Go ask Peter. Go ask Jonah. And again, three times, Praise the Lord, all ye Gentiles, and laud, praise him, laud him. All ye people. So the Gentiles coming to salvation was spoken about in the Old Testament. And 
This was written aforetime for our learning. There were Gentiles that came and got right. The Queen of Sheba, Naaman, the Syrian, the woman, the widow woman that either Elijah, Elijah, I forget which one of those two, helped and took care of. Noah was a Gentile. Abraham was a Gentile. Enoch, raptured, was a Gentile. All those men. Enoch shows me that there's a rapture coming pretty soon of Gentiles. That's a prophecy. And again, Isaiah said, There shall be a root of Jesse, and he that shall rise to reign over the Gentiles, and him shall the Gentiles trust. There we are. Did you know that you that are saved are written in the Old Testament? There you are. As the body of Jesus Christ. Now, this, now the God of hope. Fill you with all joy and peace. In believing that ye may abound in hope. Through the prayer, uh, through the power of the Holy Ghost. You've got to have the Holy Ghost to get your joy, your peace. Then we read somewhere that if you don't have the Holy Ghost, you're not of His. So if you're not of His, you're not going to get the joy and peace and hope. The God of hope. He's God of all hope, abound in hope. you got to get it. He ain't just going to give it to you. We've got a guy who behaved himself. He keeps crying, peace, peace, peace. I went over to try to show him the peace. He's got no peace. He's lost. How do you know, Stanley, that he's lost? How dare you judge that man? Because he, he comes out outwardly saying, where's the peace? It's in God. The hope. That guy's crying out with his own words. I don't have God. So did I attack him? No, I took the sword out and tried to show him where he can get the peace. And I myself also am persuaded of you, my brethren, saved people, that ye also are full of goodness. That's great. Filled with all knowledge. Wonderful. Able also to acknowledge one another, and that's the warn. Brother, what you're doing, you're going down a bad pathway. Your son, you better correct that child. You two need to do something about your marriage. You need to get in that Bible a lot more. Come on, you keep falling. Will you, will you stand with us? You need to get in church. That's what it means. And you've got to judge in order to acknowledge one another. Because you got to look at somebody and say, hey, you, you got a problem. Nevertheless, brethren, I have written the more boldly unto you in some sort. I don't know if we talk about just this letter or maybe another letter. As putting you in mind, he's on his mind, because of the grace that is given to me of God. He persecuted the church, remember? That I should be the minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles. Is that word minister again? To help, take care of. Paul's ministry is to the Gentiles. Peter was it to the Jews. So why do you get in religious organization? That says they build their hierarchy on Peter. And their hierarchy, their church represents all the Gentiles. Is there something wrong with that? If you're going to start a church, a worldwide church. I would at least build it on Paul to be scriptural. 
There are more Gentiles in that organization than there are Jews. And they don't like Jews. So that's how you know right there the Catholic Church is wrong. Ministering to Jews by Peter, the apostle, to the Gentiles. I mean the, the Jews. Every once in a while they'll throw a, a Pope John Paul in there. John was also of the Jewish people. So scripturally, in the book of Romans, Rome, the church, Paul says, I'm the one of the Gentiles. And they get it wrong. Ministering the gospel of God. You mean not six flags? Bouncy houses? Picnics? Ministering giving, helping, aiding the gospel of God that the offering up of the Gentiles might be acceptable being sanctified by the Holy Ghost. Paul is preaching the gospel that people may get separated from their sins by Jesus Christ and God being taken them by the Holy Spirit to be their children, his children. I have therefore, whereof I may glory through Jesus Christ in those things which pertain to God. For I will not dare to speak of any of those things which Christ has not wrought by me to make the Gentiles obedient by word and deed. Now what's that one? Paul says, any signs I've done is not for you Gentiles. Those were the Jewish people that I worked with. You you don't get you don't get signs. I'm not going to boast about the sign. I'm not going to boast about the healing. That's not you. You in verse 14 are good and knowledgeable, and you acknowledge one another. That's the Gentile church. We're not signs. Gen the signs are not going to force the Gentiles to get right. Through mighty signs and wonders by the power of the Spirit of God, so that from Jerusalem and round about unto Icurium, I have fully preached the gospel of Christ. All right, I did signs, but I fully preached the gospel. And you don't see many signs by Paul being recorded. But you do see him walking in synagogues and preaching and teaching wherever he went. You definitely saw that in the book of Acts. Man, as soon as he gets off the boat, he finds the nearest synagogue, walks in there, sits there in the, 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 the message. And when they say, is there anybody going to say anything? He raises his hand and preaches Jesus Christ. He stands on a mountain at the, at the Mount Rushmore of Rome and, and preaches to all the people, the unknown gods. I'll tell you who the unknown God is. It ain't a president. It's the Lord Jesus Christ. Yea, so have I strived to preach the gospel. Not where Christ was named. Least I should build upon another man's foundation. Now this is interesting. And I've got it written in my Bible somewhere. But we started a few years ago. Our street ministry <clears throat> at the Daytona Beach Farmer's Market. We preach the gospel, we've got signs, we pass out gospel tracts. If any man would come to that farmer's market and try to do the same thing we're doing, they would be doing what Paul did not do. Now, if there's somewhere in Port Orange, a city just south of us, if there's a place where people gather and a man is there with a Bible preaching the word, Trying to get people saved. I have no right to go where that man is. Even if it's a different day. I have no right to go where that man is. And preach because that's the ground that God's giving him. What you're doing is you're stepping on someone else's ministry. You don't go into someone else's church. And then demand to speak. In Christ. That's his labor. That's his ground. You do it by being offered. You do it by invitation. 
Yea, so have I strived to preach the gospel not where Christ was named. Least I should build upon another man's foundation. But as it is written, to whom he was not spoken of, they shall see. And that they have not heard shall understand. Go where somebody else has not ever heard and build there. Why go somewhere else where somebody, why go down to the farmer's market where, where we are? We're already preaching the gospel to them. Go somewhere else in Daytona and find where the gospel is not being preached to a whole different group of people. I think that's probably why one of the things why we left the, the ocean walk. That's not our territory. That's that's our church, Bible Baptist Church of the Land. That's their territory. God has given us our particular spot. We got people that love us there. We got people that hate us there. We've got Satan who's there just as faithful as we are there. That's our spot. And they match this verse with chapter 10 with, you know, the feet that go out with the gospel. For which cause also I have been much hindered from coming to you. Paul's like, I want to go to Rome. I want to see you guys. But you know what? I keep finding all these empty places. I keep finding places where the gospel is not being preached and I'm, I've got to stop and preach. You know, there's not too many places where you can go in America where the gospel has not been preached. I am born in 1968. I am 48 years old. I would say mine is what? Last four years. I'll say four years. As far as I can remember, what my ears can remember, it's about four years ago. Every Christmas, everywhere you went, you heard Christmas carols. Most of the songs were about the Savior that came into the world. Joy to the world. Little Bethlehem. Even though some of those carols are wrong. But they were dedicated to the Lord Jesus Christ. Many churches would have the manger scene, though wrong, they would have it out. Listen, Americans couldn't walk down the street. They couldn't shop four years ago without hearing something about Jesus Christ in this season. Now we're getting to the times in America where the Bible's gone and the carols are gone and everything's gone, including the manger scenes are gone. We've got to get out there from our church. We've got to get off the soft, goofy uh, pew. And we've got to go find those places where there are people out there who do not know who Jesus Christ is. In America, never mind the heathen. There are people out there that think their church is getting them to heaven and they don't realize it's not. You got to get out there, find your place where people have, haven't heard about Jesus that need the truth and preach it there. And pray for that spot and stand your ground. I call Daytona Beach Farm Market, I call it my church where two or three are gathered together. I got my family, and there's some people that like me there and some that don't. That's my church. I'm going to root and ground until the Lord says, pick up and go. As every time I can be there, I try to preach the gospel to the lost. That's what Paul's talking about. I go here, they don't know anything about Jesus. So he preaches. We go to Walmart. My wife passes out gospel tracts. The people sitting around. The people who are, are in line. She passes it because they don't know about Jesus. And you can't preach there because they won't allow Jesus to be preached. But you can hand them a piece of paper. That's the ministry she's got. Whensoever I take my journey into Spain, I will come to you, for I trust to see you in my journey, and to be brought on my way thitherward by you, if first I be somewhat filled with your company. I'm planning on going to Spain. I'm going to stop and see you guys. You're on my agenda. You're on my to-do list. He sends a letter off before he wants to go. 
Anybody recognize verse 25? But now I go into Jerusalem to minister to the saints. That's chapter 19 and chapter 20, 21 and 22. And this date here in chapter 20 is AD 59. The date I got here is AD 60. Because I want to go. But I got to go to Jerusalem. So when he writes, I want to see you, but, but I'm being stopped on the way. I got plans going to Spain. The Holy Spirit's telling Paul, go to Rome. He said, no, nope, I got to go to Jerusalem. Now, how's that? Yeah. It's many a time, many lost time. So it was in Paul's heart to go to Rome, but he went to Jerusalem. When the Christians told him not to do it, Agabus told him not to do it. I think a couple more, the Holy Spirit was recorded not to tell him. So Paul reveals, hey, he's a sinner just like you and I. He disobeyed God. What disobedience did God would Paul do? Adam, do not eat that fruit. Paul, do not go to Jerusalem. Ah, here he is. He's brought the Gentiles to the temple. Ah. We all disobey God, and we have to suffer the consequences. But here's a remarkable statement. He wanted, it. what if he just said, okay, hightail it to Rome and Spain? We would not have had extra chapters in the book of Acts. And we may not even have the book of Romans, though. I don't know. So, but now I go unto Jerusalem to minister unto the saints. James and Peter are doing a very good job there. Remember he just said, verse 16, I should be a minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles. What on earth is he doing to going to the Jews? Paul just wrote in his own words before it happens that you are in trouble, Paul. Yeah, he was bringing money to, to help saints. to the saints. And that's probably what he meant right here to help the saints. But he just wanted to go to Jerusalem. He's like he's like a lot, a lot of these Baptists say, "Oh, I want to go visit the Holy Land." God's like, "No, you know, don't waste your money. I'm gonna go. The footprints of Jesus." I probably just lost some people in that one too. For it has pleased them of Macedonia and Achaia to make a certain contribution. There's that contribution you just mentioned. For the poor saints which are at Jerusalem. Okay, I'm going to bring money. You could have sent somebody else, Paul. When the Holy Spirit told you no. So here are churches in Asia sending relief to the home church in Jerusalem. I think it's going to happen in America pretty soon. I think our missionary churches are going to have to support our churches. I mean, right now, what's happening in my life right now, I've had to cut back on the missionary support. And I feel bad. And pray if I can only get a job so I can get back helping more. It had pleased them verily, and their debtors they are. For if the Gentiles had been made partakers of the spiritual thing, their duty is also to minister unto the carnal thing. The Gentiles are helping the Jews. They're like, hey, we've got to give carnal money to help the spiritual work of the church. We've got to work to give money for the work of the church. There it is. When therefore I have performed this and have sealed to them this fruit, when I tell them about what's going on here, I will come by you into Spain. Now, you'll come by, by by being in jail, by being for Festus, by Felix, by, I forget the other one, and you're going to come to a, a shipwreck, you're going to end up on this island, you're going to be bit by a snake, and then finally you're going to come to Rome in chains. 
And they're not even going to know who your persecutors were because they don't even show up. And I am sure that when I come unto you, I shall come in the fullness of the blessings of the gospel of Christ. A little late, but he does get there. He hires his own house, and we're ready to book it. People come knocking on his door. I wish that would happen. The only people that come knocking on my door is the Jehovah Witnesses, and they don't do that no more because I take great pride in having them come to my door. Yeah, I said pride, yeah. That's wrong. It's evil. I don't think I really do it for the love of God. I just do it for just to, to have, take, fun have fun with them. I mean, they're that little mouse, and I'm the cat. I love to watch them try to leave, and I just keep on following down the road. Now I beseech you, brethren, uh, saved people, for the Lord Jesus Christ's sake, for Christ's sake, there you go, and for the love of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, that you strive together with me in your prayers to God for me. Uh, can I add a little something extra to that, if I may? Talking about the present context that we're talking about right now you may think that paul is saying you pray with me because i know the holy spirit doesn't want me to go to jerusalem but i want to go I, I just that's the same context it may not be but i just always think of paul like i want to go to jerusalem and i know i'm not supposed to at what point has agabus spoke to him yet as the christian spoke to him yet i want to go i'm going to go no matter what for the will i will die in jerusalem will you guys pray for me i don't know Come on, don't be so biased to tell me you've never had that prayer for saints to pray for you and you know God said no. I'll come out, I'll say it. I've had that prayer, God says no, and, uh, please God, please. Then I may be delivered from them that do not believe in Judea. Oh, what is that remark? I am going to Jerusalem. And there are people who do not believe in Jerusalem. And that my service which I have for Jerusalem may be acceptable and uh, accepted of the saints. It's like he knows he's going to walk into trouble. Remember Agabus told him he grabbed, one, some, he grabbed somebody's girdle and he said, you're going to be bound as this man's girdle it is was, bound? It was girdle. It was Paul's girdle. Paul's girdle, but I mean, he bound him. And I wanted Paul like, I want to go. Can you pray for it? I think I'm going to get some hostility here. Can you shut Agabus up? Can you shut the Holy Spirit up? Can you shut the Christians up so I can go there for my countrymen? Isn't that interesting? That I may be delivered from them that do not believe in Judea. And what exactly happened? I mean, I don't even think it was a week that he was in Jerusalem. That I may come unto you with joy by the will of God. Oh, look at that. Don't you see what this, this chapter is saying? Paul, don't go. I want you in Rome. It is the will of God for me to go to Rome. And when we read those chapters early in Acts. And may with you be refreshed. Oh, yeah, you're going to need a refreshing ball. Now the God of peace be with you all. Amen. That's an interesting chapter. Paul was a sinner just like you and me. 